for you younger guys, it's hard to wrap your head around the fact that at one point, nitro racing was the coolest thing in the world. Before the corporate drones and the cookie cutter cars, there were hundreds of fuelers across the country. Top fuel, you know, the dragsters, funny cars, fuel alters. When I was younger, I was totally eat up with this stuff. I started street racing, but my whole goal was to eventually go fuel racing. You know, and I got a chance to do that. I spent about 12, 13 years, you know, deep in it. and had my hands on over like 20 cars. And, you know, the science, the thing that always fascinated me about nitro cars is that they operate in their own environment. Rules that apply to other forms of, of racing and engines don't apply to nitro. And it wasn't until the very end, uh, you know, when, it, when I really started to lose interest in it. And I'll tell you why I started to lose interest. Um, there was, I, got in, I got involved in it in the, in the late 80s, middle to late 80s. And I ran up until like 98, I think it was last year. And um, it started, the, okay, there, there were always guys with money involved in, in fuel racing. Um, but there were still a lot of regular people too, you know, guys that worked regular jobs that had, you know, regular small businesses and, you know, they would pool the resources and go out and they'd run a fuel car. Um, and they could stand a chance to go against the big money guys. You know, back then the big money guys were like people like uh, Schumacher and, and Snow, and I hate to even say his name, but, um, you know, but it, it, the, the tide started to turn around 1986 or so, um, when Kenny Bernstein uh, who had been involved, and he was like, you know, a, a, he, he guy had money, um, but he made millions with the, with a, with a, a, a restaurant chain, and he hired Dale Armstrong, who was like one of the greatest minds, you know, the sport has ever known, to tune him. And uh, the thing about Bernstein was, and this is like, you know, the legend, but you know, this is really what happened. He couldn't drive, you know, back then, uh, late 1980s, middle uh, 1980s. Fuel cars were very, very violent, and uh, you know, stuff just happened suddenly, and it was a lot of you know, violence. Okay, and Bernstein uh, didn't acclimate to these cars as well as he should have, and Armstrong kept feeding it more and more fuel, kept fattening the car up to soften it, so that, you know Bernstein could get a handle on driving it, um, and it worked. Eventually, uh, he added a second magneto to burn some of this extra fuel and then the car really picked up and went. So what happened was he, the, that revolution, um, that was the turning point between, you know, the, 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 the violent, cool, fun cars of, you know, the, let's say the 60s, the 70s and the early 80s and the ones that we have today. And that's pretty much like where I came along. I came along just as this revolution was getting started. And also uh, the, the race pack computer, that was brand new too. I was working for Jerry Camnito when Ray Alley first introduced that computer. We actually had the very first race pack on a car. This was in Gainesville in like 1986 or 1987. And um, again, that was like the beginning of the end. I started to really lose interest when I was, we were uh, trying to qualify for a national event. I forget which one it was. And... Um, we were there with a ramp truck, and it was, it was me and, and, and my partner, and just a couple of guys with t in T-shirts. And we had a ramp truck, and we had all the basic stuff, all hand tools, you know, stuff we just out of the garage and you know, went. And uh, we were pitted next to uh, 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 John Force, who at the time had just gotten, like, like deep into the Castro money. And uh, we had a ramp truck and all of our, you know, shoddy stuff, and we're flogging on our car. And Force is there with two cars, and each car has an 18-wheeler. And then there was a third 18-wheeler, which was his technology center, and it was, like, just front to back. It was just people on computers, you know, and, and, and figuring all this stuff out. And I was like, no, that's it. This stuff is just not fun anymore. And I lost interest, like, you know, from that point on. The next year or two that I was doing it, I was just, like, you know, going through the motions. But at any rate... What I wanted to turn you guys on to, um, Nitro has a reputation as being like a, a, like a vicious bitch of a fuel, but it's not. Um, so let's go back to those days. I had my hands on probably about 20 cars over the years, and I had developed a basic tune-up, which was actually something that I had got, I inherited from Gene Adams. Um, he gave me the, 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 the initial setup and then I modified it to work with the cars that we were, you know, working with and it wasn't anything that would, you know, rotate the planet, but most of the racing that we did back then was on like small unprepared tracks, um, 
very, very much like the no prep movement of today, except we were doing it with blown nitro cars. So if you made too much horsepower, you weren't going to stick it to the ground anyway. So I developed this tune-up that would basically get anything down the track without hurting itself in like a, a, a representative time for an unprepped track of the day. Um, if you really stepped on this, it would actually get you qualified in the back half of an NHRA you know, event. So at any rate, um, it was so effective that I published a two-part story in Superstock and Drag Illustrated, I guess it was like 1995, uh, on this basic tune-up. And a bunch of guys who, got, uh, at the time, the Nostalgia Top Fuel and Funny Car thing was just starting to get going, and a bunch of guys actually used that as the blueprint to get their operations going. So it was an effective tune-up. But here's where I ran into the wall, and here's where I did, like, the real learning. What I found was that tune-up worked well on a stock stroke motor, 426 cubic inches. It worked well on a half-inch stroke motor with no changes, really, to the, the, the uh, 484 cubic inches. And there really wasn't that big of a difference, you know, in, in terms of fuel demand between the 426 and the 484. But then when you take that tune-up and you put it on a 5 8 which is... Uh, uh, just 12 cubic inches bigger, 484 to a 496, the fuel requirements changed drastically. You had to feed it a bunch of fuel just to keep it happy, not to make extra power, but just to keep it happy from beating itself up. And this is where the unique property of nitromethane, like the, the key, the cornerstone of working with nitromethane comes from. What I found when I was working with that 5 8 combination tried to put that the, the, the basic tune-up into a 5 8 was that this is a liner from a KB. Uh, I borrowed this from my buddy Troy Ray. So I'm going to show you, I'm going to try to get in here and get a look at this. Anybody who's ever been inside of an engine, rebuilt an engine, knows these lines. These are compression witness marks from the top of, you know, the top of the stroke, the piston comes up and it when 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 the mixture lights it compress it, it it expands the rings into the cylinder wall and it digs these little lines in and over a couple hundred thousand miles they become like a ridge you know you're familiar with that here's the thing about nitromethane here's the bottom of this same liner okay and if you can see right here there are two witness marks that match the top ones so in other words You've got the compression pulse, or the, you know, the, the, the pressure pulse that comes with firing it. It expands the rings. But then when you get to the bottom, there's a second pulse that expands the rings again. So why did the 5 8 motor require so much more fuel to be happy than the half-inch motor? The bores were the same, only 12 cubic inches in difference. Why did it take... 15 to 20 percent more fuel to keep the 5 8 motor from detonating itself. It was because of the piston deceleration rate of the longer stroke or the shorter rod ratio. So the longer the rod ratio, the more time the piston spends at top dead center and at bottom dead center, no dwell time. And the slower it accelerates from that standing start to halfway down the stroke and then decelerates to halfway down the stroke. As you make the crank bigger and keep the rod length the same, the piston accelerates quicker from this point and then decelerates quicker from this point. Well, at the 5 8 inch size, that deceleration rate causes a second pressure pulse which expands the rings but not quite detonation, almost detonation. I ran into the brick wall when I tried to put that tune up on a three quarter inch stroke motor, which was just starting to come into, into you know, that was the thing now. This is like in, in 1993, 1994. I had a friend of mine in Chicago who had a fuel altered and he asked me to come out and, and try to get a handle on the car. And he had just put this three quarter inch stroke crank in it because they were all over the place and he got a good deal on it. So it was the same combination as the, uh, you know, the, the, the same bore, the same rod length, the same everything, but just with 
the slightly longer rug went from went from uh, four point. Uh, uh, <laughs> see, this is this is the brain tumor. This is this is you know okay. Um, when the stock stroke is four and a quarter, the half inch is four eighty four, the five eighths is four ninety six, and the three quarter is just over. Uh, 500 cubic inches and at that point actually they started shrinking down the liners to stay under the NHRA rule for 500 cubic inches so at any rate make a long story short the only difference was this three-quarter crank so we ran the car put my tune up on the car and we ran it and it it itself alive it destroyed everything I remember pulling the heads off of this thing and just looking down the holes and it was just like just shrapnel okay so like, oh geez I don't know what happened here so we put the car back together again. All right, so we'll go a little bit easier on it. So I took some blower away, took some mag away, took some fuel away, took a little clutch off, sent the car again. Same thing, destroyed everything. I'm looking down the holes and it's like, just, just, just Armageddon, right? Pissed in Armageddon. But the plugs didn't look bad. And the liners, when, when, when you got the tune up right on one of these motors, the liners are wet after a run. They've got like this oily film. And the liners were wet. This engine was showing absolutely no signs of being lean. But when you got to the pistons, they were destroyed. They were pounded, banged, cracked, just burned, melted. It was terrible. Took more fuel away. Took more blow away. Took more mega away. Took everything away. Softened this thing up as soft as it could get. And only lessened the destruction a little bit. Just threw me totally off my, you know, off my game. And on top of that, my poor friend is just pouring money into this thing like there's no tomorrow. Well, I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Well, that was it. What happened was that difference between the four point, uh, the, 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 the five eighths stroke crank and the three quarter inch stroke crank, that deceleration rate at the bottom of the stroke was enough so that the flame front really crashed with it and it was detonating like crazy at the bottom of the stroke. And the solution to this was to blow a bunch of fuel through it. And actually, um, come to think of it, if you ever notice like fuel cars, uh, they'll do a burnout, they'll back up and then they go what they call the high side and they'll just start spewing gas, right? That's because on the burnout, they're getting fuel, they're getting heat into the motor. Backing up, they're getting heat into the motor. But then when they, they're about to move forward they start spraying that fuel what that's doing is they're literally hosing that motor down to cool the pistons down and get all of the temperature out of the engine to avoid that bottom hole detonation so my the the quick formula you know that I came up with with this is the ed, the exhaust valve opening point is directly tied to the rod ratio so basically the shorter the rod ratio the sooner you have to open the exhaust valve in order to evacuate that chamber uh, and, and keep it from getting into that bottom hole detonation and of course running a bunch of fuel through it uh, to keep everything cool it's that combination of things um, and again like I said at that point I had really run out of interest in it like you know the the, the, the colorful guys were gone, the colorful cars were gone, the small events that we used to be able to go to and, and, and you know, and, and, and do our thing on an unprepped track or, or a barely prepped track, those days were gone. And all the, you know, the fun was gone. It was just over. So, at, you know, at that point, I was like, you know, I'm done. So, uh, and, you know, I, I never looked back, but at least I had the experience. It was a fun experience. At any rate, I don't know, I just figured I'd share it, guys, uh, share it with you guys. And, uh back to doing things like slant sixes and nitrous 318s. I'll see you tomorrow.